Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday School lesson coming to you today from the First United Methodist Church in Humboldt, Tennessee. My name is Ben Barnett, and we are continuing today on our discussion of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Today we will focus on a passage from 1 Corinthians. And this passage will help us understand the difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Now, perhaps a good place to begin is to look at the word wisdom. The dictionary definition is simple and straightforward. Wisdom is knowledge and good judgment based on experience. To understand this lesson will require information and it very likely will take some time to pass before we can truly appreciate what Paul is saying to us in 1 Corinthians. Now, I must confess that I'm sort of old school when it comes to naming the books of the Bible. Our literature and most modern writings use the term 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and so forth. But whatever we choose to say, it's basically a letter. The author was Paul, and it was written to the Christian believers in the city of Corinth, which was, and still is for that matter, a large and significant city in Greece. Some historians believe that perhaps as many as 600,000 people lived in Corinth during the first century AD. It was the wealthiest and most important city in Greece. It also was a very pagan city. Temples and altars to the various pagan gods were scattered throughout the town. Temple prostitution was prominent. The church in Corinth was founded by Paul and we read in Acts chapter 18 that he lived there for about 18 months preaching and teaching among the Gentiles. First Corinthians was written to a divided church. Some of the leaders there were demanding personal loyalty rather than loyalty to Christ. The community was extremely diverse, rich, poor, educated, illiterate, free, slave, Jewish, Gentile. Paul must have struggled to understand how people who believed a gospel of God's equal unconditional love could break communion with one another in so many ways. Ultimately, he determined that the cause for this was his distinction between human knowledge on the one hand and divine wisdom on the other. Paul opened his letter by describing this distinction forcibly and clearly. He laid this foundation in the beginning would help him address practical congregational problems that they would face later, such as the food offering to islands, idols, excuse me, communal meals, and the Lord's Supper. The text for this lesson elaborates on what Paul has described as the underlying cause for congregational unrest. Jews asked for signs, Greeks looked for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. And so with this background behind us, we're ready now to hear the focal passage. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. 1 Corinthians, second chapter, verses 10 through 16. God has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, including the depths of God. Who knows a person's depths except their own spirit that lives in them? And in the same way, no one has known the depths of God except God's Spirit. We haven't received the world spirit, but God's spirit, so that we can know the things given to us by God. These are the things we are talking about. 
not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the Spirit. We are interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people. But people who are unspiritual don't accept the things from God's Spirit. They are foolishness to them and, <coughs> excuse me, and can't be understood because they can only be comprehended in a spiritual way. Spiritual people comprehend everything, but they themselves aren't understood by anyone. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who will advise him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now the key verse is are found in the middle of this reading. Hear it again. We haven't received the world spirit, but God's spirit. So we can know that the things given to us by God, these are the things we are talking about. Not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the spirit. We are interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people. In chapter one, Paul had reflected on the meaning of wisdom. He used the Greek term Sophia for this, which is the root for the English word sophisticated. Paul contrasted two types of Sophia. One refers to the human understanding of what's true in life. This is wisdom gained through study, reflection, and experience. It's logical and rational and expressed in philosophies and proverbs. Paul was actually quite well versed in this area. He could hold his own with Greek philosophers, as was demonstrated in his speech in Athens that you can read about in Acts 17. However, the apostles specified that he intentionally did not reveal this side of himself to the Corinthians. He did not desire to appear as an expert in speech or wisdom. He expressed concern that human wisdom would interfere with their faith. Paul disguised himself in this manner because he knew that such human-based wisdom can lead to pride, ultimately dividing a community. The Corinthians already embodied such proud divisions, with some choosing the teachings of Apollos and some Cephas and so forth. And there is indeed a higher understanding of Sophia, and Paul's humble approach embodied it. God's wisdom is something beyond our understanding or our own making. It has been hidden as a secret as we read in Corinthians 2. This is reminiscent of the author of Job, describing how God has hidden wisdom throughout creation, totally to our bewilderment. But now, Paul said, God's secret Sophia has been revealed in a very and most dramatic manner. Salvation comes through the unlikely form of death. And resurrection. When Paul wrote of such secret wisdom, it bordered on Gnosticism, a religion that emphasized salvation through processing special, hidden spiritual knowledge. The difference, though, is that for Paul, God's secret is embodied in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. And consequently, we are all privileged to gain this knowledge through the work of the Holy Spirit. As we saw last week, the Holy Spirit is associated with action. The wind blows, tongues of fire dance, people's lives are changed. Similarly, Paul's ministry to the Corinthians was characterized by humility. It was laced with a demonstration of the Spirit and of the Spirit's power. The apostles now stated what this relentless spirit who reveals God to us searches everything, including the depths of God. Paul uses this word search one other time 
And this is in Romans chapter 8 when he wrote about how the Spirit intervenes for us. The one who searches our hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the Spirit consistent with God's will. This conveys this sense of intense examining so that nothing remains hidden and all is revealed. The Spirit understands us better than we understand ourselves. The Spirit also understands the divine depths, meaning the complete thoughts, intentions, emotions, perhaps even of God. When we are baptized, the Spirit reveals God's heart in a way that could only have been hoped for before Christ. There is no longer a barrier between us and Christ's Father. And living in the Christian community will continually make our parents, that is God's desires, more visible to us. When Paul used this same word for spirit here as he did for the Holy Spirit, the sense in this verse is more descriptive. Here it conveys the essence of the people that which empowered the individual to think, feel, decide, and act. It reflects the person's core inner self, which identifies his or her uniqueness, attitudes, feelings, and character. We could understand it perhaps as an ultimate orientation of heart and mind. The image of God's thoughts guiding a believer is one of the standards Paul set before the church. He encouraged Christians to do everything possible to allow the Spirit to bring Jesus' teachings and actions to their mind. Christians should then emphasize worship activities that build up the mind. They should strive to have the attitude of Christ who lived humbly. They should focus their thoughts on all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. The result of having the mind of Christ would be peace within the Corinthian fellowship. If your thoughts are as Christ's thoughts, how could there be division? How could there not be an outpouring of grace and an avocation for justice? Now, scholars think Paul perhaps wrote several letters to Corinth, but only two of which have survived. This volume of correspondence reflects the difficulty he had in helping them move toward spiritual maturity. Laying aside pride and seeking the mind of Christ is a lifelong task. Centuries later, John Wesley would call this moving from justification to sanctification. Paul said that the consequences of striving for the higher wisdom is that we will appear alien to those still living by human standards. What we gain, though, helps those standards lose their appeal. In the closing verse, verse of our focal passage, Paul gives us an image to guide us on our path to the higher wisdom. Daily living, especially interacting with others, provides opportunities to reflect on thoughts and things from Christ's point of view. As we go about our daily lives, we need to look for opportunities to quietly reflect on those times in which we have experienced extraordinary insight and understanding about yourself, or perhaps how you solved a particular problem or dilemma. Think, try to recognize 
Was it the Spirit's presence? Let us pray. Master, we seek to think your thoughts. Feel your emotions. Help us discern how we may embody in our lives your amazing humility and compassion. Amen. Thank you. Stay safe.